for Shane's here. Uh, we're now in the environmental lab spaces on the third floor. These spaces are uh, fall within the School of Environment and Horticultural Studies. The courses that run in here include environmental field and lab technology, the uh, horticulture sciences, the landscape uh, technology, um, greenhouse, uh, other environmental programs include environmental management and assessment, ecological risk assessment. The uh, geographical information system program is also supported. So that's East 303, East 305, and East 306 are all labs that fall within the School of Environment and Horticulture. And um, East 303 and East 305, which both labs are very similar to the one that we're looking at right now and uh, has a lot of the equipment in it. The East 306 lab, which we're going to show you later, is a, um, it's called a dry lab. So there's no wet chemistry, there's no hazardous materials used in there. And uh, it's more of a specimen lab. So if you're looking at slides or actual specimens of butterflies or insects and stuff like that. The wet labs hold uh, 30 students uh, at capacity and ideally 24 is a good number and uh, the East 306 lab can hold uh, a bit more than that. Um, yeah, so I'm going to just start out with the survey stuff. So uh, this piece of equipment here, this is a total station, actually that's this is the front, this is the user side on this side. And the user, this can uh, jack up a little bit higher so that you're looking through the viewfinder. The purpose of the total station is uh, for, um, basically you're looking at, uh, you can measure distances and heights and angles and stuff like that. So you can get a contour. It's very helpful in both like landscape design as well as uh, environmental assessments so that you can like map out your area. The technician looks through this and shoots uh, an optical beam of light to this prism pole and it takes a, it bounce, bounces back a reading. So you know what height your unit's at, you know uh, based on benchmarks in the area. So we have specific benchmarks on campus that we know exactly what the uh, GPS points are. So we're able to, okay, this is the point we're trying to see what's the height, what's the distance of this exact point. So they're all components of the total station. So this is um, a similar type of apparatus. This is uh, just a simple level system. So this is a very simple leveling system compared to the total station. This basically determines height and angles. It doesn't do distance. Um, you would mount this on the tripod, a tripod similar to that, and then you read the height from this um, leveling rod and it extends pretty high. So then you're able to determine at that point what is the height. So similar uses for environmental, you know, surveying your land for environmental studies or construction operations. This here is used in environmental assessments all the time. It's also got, it's called a planimeter or what I just like to call it, a measuring wheel. And you just zero it and then you roll along and as you go, it's recording how far you've walked. So it's a little bit, a little bit better than, you know, calibrating your step and, you know, counting your steps. Mm -hmm. It's just a bit more accurate than that. Uh, but that is a technique that is used. You basically just count your steps and then walk around the site and then you can kind of figure oh. out how, how far you've gone just by knowing what your stride is. This is just a tape measure. It's a big, large tape measure. It helps to survey. We've recently got into using drones. We've just started introducing those in the last couple of years. We have, uh, I believe it's seven drones on campus in our area. Um, this is, uh, I call it a mini drone. Basically these little drones 
Um, because they weigh less than 250 grams, you don't need to have an SFOC, which is through Transport Canada. If you have a bigger drone like this, that's definitely going to hurt somebody if it falls out of the air, you need to have um, proper, cert you need to actually have a flight license to fly these ones. Oh, okay. So um, these are, we consider these are practice drones. And if you master the practice drone, then you're allowed to use the more expensive uh, research. Uh, I need, if they're, I need authorization from their teacher to give them this one, because I need to basically see, okay, let me see your pilot license and do you trust them with it kind of thing. Um, this one, uh, you don't, I, I can sign that out to any student because you don't need a license to operate it. This is a, uh, this is a higher end GPS, so global positioning system. It's, uh, it's just, a, it's more accurate, it's much more expensive than just a cheaper GPS. This, these are about 500, these are about 7,000. And basically, these ones will do like a couple meters accuracy. And these ones can get down to, um, with all the attachments uh, that you can buy with it, you can get down to less than 10 centimeters accuracy on it. Yeah. So if you're really trying to get uh, good detail, you want to get uh, a better accuracy unit. Same with the total stations. They're very, they're very accurate in their measurements. Um, so these just sort of give you a ballpark. Uh, again, for mapping, mapping out an area, right? So you want to, so it's for determining your position, right? When you want to get a GPS point, right? Just see where you are. You can put it on a map and you can make a map, create a map of your uh, environmental site that you're working on. Okay. You want to tell somebody, okay, where do I need to go to sample? Oh, well, these are the GPS coordinates. This is... Uh, kind of general water quality equipment that we tend to use quite frequently. Uh, the main things that you're measuring when you're measuring uh, the quality of your surface water, um, you're almost always going to want to measure pH and conductivity, temperature, always temperature, and uh, very frequently dissolved oxygen. If your dissolved oxygen is really low, uh, it's not going to be able to support your like the, the fish living in there. Um, and the, so these two, so this is dissolved oxygen. This is our preferred uh, meter for that. It's a fairly newer model. Um, YSI is a very good manufacturer. And um, this is just what the probe looks like. This is just a protective shroud. This is the sensing element, and uh, I won't go into all the technology involved in it, but it measures dissolved oxygen. We have a bunch of different models of equipment that does all this. This is the set that everyone likes the best because it's so easy to use and very robust. Do we have one of those? We have 10. 10 of those, okay. We have 10 sets of this. And then we have a few sets of other things, other, other styles and stuff like that. They're just, they're just not preferred. But we'll have like a class set of 10. And then we also need to have some spares on hand for when students want to book stuff out. So if I have a class set out, I can still book something out to a group of students. So this is, uh, this is called, um, well, it's Tech Pro 2. I always call them ultrameters because that was the original uh, model that I bought, and we all call them ultrameters, but that's that's a model name. Um, but if you say, we all know that that's what they're called, so we they call them the same thing. This measures two uh, parameters. Uh, this cell here will measure conductivity, and with a calculation that the meter does, it can also measure TDS. TDS is total dissolved solids. So electrical uh, conductivity, electrical conductivity is uh, a measure of the n amount of dissolved salts okay. in your solution. So if you have um, a lot of, let's say in the winter time, you've got a lot of salt and sand on the road, salt and sand runs into the uh, creeks, you're going to have 
after the runoff, your salinity or your um, conductivity is going to be higher because there's more salts so dissolved in solution in your creek. You don't retreat that. Okay. It, ju it just gives you a picture of what you're, what you're looking for. Um, this cell measures pH, and you'll see that there's a little bulb in there. All pH uh, utilizes, uh, most pH utilizes uh, a sensing bulb in it. I won't go into more technology than that. Um, and pH tells you how um, basic or acidic uh, your solution is. It's, Roy showed you pH downstairs. It's used in the lab extensively. It's used in the field extensively. Um, just helps to give you a picture of the quality of your water. This is a turbidity meter that is sometimes used in the field. And you just have like a little sample cell and you plug it in there. So basically with turbidity, so you can imagine if this was a really turbid sample or cloudy, it's gonna, the light is not gonna pass through here as well. So it's basically a measure of the light passing through. And uh, it'll just tell you how, how much silt is maybe tossed up in your, uh, in your water system. This is a flow meter. So we've got the wand and then you've got your meter. And you basically flip this down so that it's pointed into the flow of the stream. And as the water flows past it, it spins the propeller. The propeller is calibrated. So for every rotation, it, it's calibrated to uh, flow rate or speed. And so you can tell how fast your creek is flowing. You set, you'd basically use this rod to set it. The proper depth is six tenths of the depth of the water from the bottom. So you know how you measure how deep your stream is and then you set this at the proper height and then the meter will record the flow rate. So I'll just blow on that. <laughs> or maybe not, but if you spin it, you can see that there's numbers coming up on there. It shows you the flow. So it's important to know, right? Like if, if there's, you know, something entering the stream, if you know how fast the stream is flowing, you can see how quickly that might be cleared out of that area. Uh, here we have a couple of um, wildlife monitoring devices. So we have a wildlife uh, course, uh, wildlife monitoring course in the ecosystem restoration program. And uh, so these are used uh, quite a bit in their program, but they're also used in the environmental field and lab program. EMA, Environmental Management and Assessment, they might also use it for like an internship project or something, but they, they're not typically used there. So this is called a trail camera. You would attach it to a tree or something like that. And a lot of hunters use these for, uh, you know, trying to get uh, images of their um, deer or whatever they're trying to track down. So it's just a camera. And it can be set up two different ways. You can set it up so that it's triggered by action. Okay. So when the deer comes in its path, then it'll tr trigger it to start. It's a video. So you can program it for still images or video. Uh, we have color and black and white ones moving towards all color. The old ones are black and white. Yeah. The newer ones also, you can program it to take time lapse. So we have, um, so part of the program is, uh, they, or part of that course, sorry, is they monitor snake hibernaculums. And what they found was the snakes don't actually trigger the camera. So they start, we started using the newer technology ones and had them like taking pictures like every so often. 
and so that they could hope to get a picture of the snakes. And hibernaculum is basically a snake den. That's oh, okay. where snakes live. This is a, um, it's either an owl uh, acoustic monitor or a bat one. I'm not sure which it is, but it's basically, it records um, bats or owl sounds. And uh, it's just used in that uh, program to sort of uh, identify um, their, their habitat. Okay. Locate where they are. Uh, so this is all kind of soil monitoring stuff. This is uh, what we've got set out in this area here. It's a basic ecological land classification kit that I sign out to the flora ID people and or the soils people. And in here you're going to find um, this is a prism and what this, uh, the, you use this, um, you just view through it and you can um, assess population density of trees, so how many trees are in a certain area. This is just a magnifier. It's just a very simple magnifier if you're wanting to look at insects or something like that. This is a clinometer. We have, this is just a manual clinometer and you use it to, um, you hold it up to your eye and you can, there's a scale in there that you can see and it tells you angle. So you focus on something you line it up with the, uh, with the line in here, and it'll tell you what your slope is. Oh, cool. This is a compass. I don't think I need to explain what a compass is. It's just for surveying. Very basic compass. We use the tape measure. This is a DBH tape, and it's for measuring the uh, diameter of a tree. Uh, DBH stands for diameter at breast height, so whenever you're doing it, you're, you're measuring the tree diameter uh, at this height. Okay. I, I really, for years, didn't know what DBH meant. <laughs> um, this here, this is 10% uh, hydrochloric acid, so it's a little, it's a little corrosive, but it's not too, too bad. It's used for um, determining uh, calcium carbonate content in, um, in your soil or in a rock sample or something like that. It, uh, it'll fizz if there's um, calcium carbonate present. Okay. And these are just tools to help you. So this is a trowel you use to sort of clear the, if you're taking a soil sample, you're gonna use your trowel to maybe dig a little divot out of the grass and then you use your auger and you auger down okay. and then you pull out your soil sample and then you can look at the color of the soil sample. The color will tell you certain things. Uh, the consistency will tell you. You want to know like some of the tests we do on soil are texture analysis tests. We use sieves for that. Um, so those soil samples are brought back here? They're brought back here. Sometimes they're just analyzed out in the field, right? You can do color and there's a field test that you can do. So you go through a little checklist and go, oh, does it feel this, does it feel that? You can basically do a rough idea of what that soil is composed of just by a field test. Okay. Um, there's also color books. So it's, they're called the Munsell color charts that they bring out to the field with them as well. And they, based on the color chart, you can kind of tell what's, uh, what's in there, uh, is like what the soil is composed of. It's similar to an auger. It's called a soil um, corer. So basically, you punch it into the soil straight down, and you pick up like an intact coil. And with soils, you can look at um, different profiles, and you can oh, see what, again. what, yeah, what, what's, you know, what's at your parent, parent material, and then you can look. Uh, you just can tell uh, different things from the, the, from the profile. This is just uh, 
I know that Roy showed you uh, a titration apparatus down in his lab. We do the same stuff up here, just for different reasons. So you can do titrations, you might maybe want to do hardness and alkalinity, uh, just to, on your sample, that's a, a popular analysis that can done, be done on a water sample. Um, so I just got a few pieces of uh, analytical tests that are routinely used. So this is a spectrometer and again deals with a passage of light and wavelength so it looks at color and you can do um, it's very very easy testing it's wet chemistry but it's uh, it's very easy stuff you basically put your water sample in there you have your reagent packet you mix it in shake it up some of the procedures might tell you to wait a while but basically the whole process is you are trying to activate so this one is for phosphorus so uh, when when you react your sample on this one it turns a blue color so the program is based on that blue color that wavelength and then you can determine how much phosphorus is in that sample so a lot of frequent parameters that we measure phosphorus or phosphates nit nitrogen or nitrates um, less often is ammonia but it's, it's just as important sulfates potassium um, they're all elements of interest or ions of interest um, for environmental sampling and they can all be done on this piece of equipment um, it's a it's a cheaper way of doing things. We have more high-end, um, which I've just thought of now. This is, uh, so it's not a spectrophotometer, but a colorimeter. Uh, similar technology though. And this one only measures chlorine. So these, this is about a $6,000 unit. This is about a $600 unit. This does many parameters, including chlorine. This only does chlorine, and it's something that you take into the field with you, and it's really easy to do. One thing that I thought would be interesting to talk about is um, tissue culture. So we actually do tissue culture in the horticulture program, and we've done it on African violets and potatoes, and ultimately we'd like to be able to do it on um, uh, Grape vines and um, brew hops and stuff like that, and and start culturing them. But when you're going from uh, live material from the field and trying to create a sterile environment for it, is it's very difficult. Haven't quite got there yet, but we will one day. Um, it 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 happens elsewhere. Just we just don't do it. Um, but basically you take, uh, for example, so for the African violet, you take like a little cutting in a sterile environment. Everything has to be sterile. Okay. And you insert it into your medium. So this is a specific kind of agar that is made for African violet. The color is just, we just dye it a certain color so we know that this is the African violet media versus the grapevine media versus the potato media. Um, so these are, you saw agar plates probably downstairs with Roy. These are agar plates that we, they're PDA, so it's potato dextrose agar. It's good for growing molds. And so you get a lot of, you have mold issues in uh, plant technology uh, quite frequently. Um, Sebastian works in the cannabis program and he's looking at specifically like fusarium um, in, in plants, so yeah, so that's something, I, I'm sure he's looking at other things, but that's one that's coming to mind. Um, so basically what the process is for that, you, you streak your, um, sorry, scratch that, with molds, with, with uh, the plant molds and stuff like that, I believe the process is different from what Roy does. Roy would streak a culture on there. 
we actually have to take a cutting of the plant that is infected and then put it on here and then it grows on there. It needs to have that live leaf in order to uh, propagate. Um, so these tissue culture tubes are, um, once you put your tissue culture in there, as long as there's no mold um, or bacteria growth, you can basically grow a plant in here and then you take that plant and plant in some soil. Yep. Yeah. Or you can then take it and then start a new, because it's all aseptic at this point, you can then start a new culture, uh, tissue culture from it. Okay, so with the uh, supporting the environmental programs, we have two higher end pieces of equipment for analytical. And uh, this is an AA spectrometer. And again, deals with the passage of light uh, and the spectrum of color. So basically in here, you have a flame. You pull a sample, a water sample through here. It shoots it into the flame, creates a little cloud burst. Uh, and then you take, you have a lamp carousel here. It shoots the beam of light for the specific element of interest. So let's say nickel passes it through the um, cloud of atoms. And you basically, based on the uh, intensity of the color of that beam of light, the detector picks it up. It can tell you the concentration of nickel or lead or copper that's in your sample. Here is an ion chromatograph. And um, I mentioned before that we do nitrates and phosphates quite frequently. Um, you can do nitrates and phosphates very accurately on this. The spectrometer is um, it's not as accurate. And with this, you can hook up an auto sampler to it and just let it run. And you can let it run, and it'll do your phosphates, your nitrates. Um, we have two different columns. We have an anion column and a cation column. So, uh, and there are specific two uh, ions that we routinely might consider measuring. Um, so basically the water passes through columns that are hooked up in here. And uh, based on retention times, which is uh, certain elements have a more higher affinity to uh, be released off of the column. And, uh, and so they come out, they elute, they come out at a specific time. So you run a standard through there and you say, okay, so at a certain time your nitrates come out at a certain time your phosphates come out and then you run your sample and go, okay, that's a phosphate peak, that's a nitrate peak. 